Welcome, it's great to see everybody here. And I understand we've got more than a thousand people viewing online through our live stream. So I would like to start off by um, first introducing myself. My name is Kathleen Creason. I'm the Executive Director of the Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons of California and a board member of the Neuropathy Action Foundation and Dominic has asked me to introduce the speakers today. So starting off, I'd like to welcome you all to the 12th annual Neuropathy Action Awareness Day. Um, it's hard to believe it's been 12 years. Uh, I think probably everybody in the room and everyone on the online knows Dominic Spatafora, who has put this program together from beginning to end for 12 years. So let's start off by giving him a big round of applause for doing that. He does such great work. I'm not sure he actually sleeps the week before this program, but you know he still uh, looks amazing. I don't know how he does it. I need a secret. So um, I also like to thank all of the sponsors and exhibitors for this program. Without them, you know, we just couldn't make it happen and, and make it accessible to everybody. So um, if you're here in the room, um, please make sure that you visit all of the exhibitors and sponsors that are um, out in the hall and also in the back of the room. Um, and also in the back of the room, you'll see that there's a silent auction. I encourage you to bid high, bid often. I've already seen Dominic's name on a couple of those, so make sure you overbid him on that. Some really great prizes this year. Um, you'll want to um, support that however you can because that, that kind of activity is the, the sort of thing that allows us to continue putting on these, these types of programs and uh, education. So um, please do support that if you can. That is going to run until 2.15 this afternoon. We're gonna close it promptly at 2.15. Um, and then just as far as logistics, we will have a break just before lunch from 11.45 to 12.15. We'll be asking everybody to get up and leave the room so that the hotel staff can reset the room. It's good to get up and, and uh, walk around and see everybody anyway. So we'll go ahead and get started with the program. Our first speaker is Todd Levine, MD. Dr. Levine is a graduate of Duke University Medical School. He's board certified in both neurology and electrodiagnostic medicine. Dr. Levine has been a member of Phoenix Neurological Associates since 1999 with a subspecialty practice in neuromuscular diseases. He's the founder and director of Samaritan ALS Clinic and co-director of the neurophysiology department at Good Samaritan Hospital. And, and just, I might mention too, you have in your program their entire biographies. If you want more details, it's in the program. The program is also available online. So right below the link where you're watching, there is a link to the program. So if you wanna get all of those details there. Um, Dr. Levine is also a clinical assistant professor at University of Arizona in neurology. I actually have a son that goes to the University of Arizona. Maybe we could talk and you can keep an eye on him, make sure he's behaving himself. <laughs> um, and, and Dr. Levine is also a, an, an advisory board member of the Neuropathy Action Foundation. I might also mention that Dr. Levine had a very special momentous occasion. I understand that he came from his son's wedding, which occurred yesterday. And uh, so he stayed out late. I, I don't know, you know, whether he was partying all that much, but it, you know, when you get a child married off. So he, uh, he left that late, came here very early to be our first speaker. So please give a round of welcome to Dr. Levine. So I was just thinking, I hope you don't have my whole biography. That could be embarrassing, actually. So, um, all right, so I was thinking when, when um, Med students uh, go through medical school, uh, there's a tendency for them not to go into neurology. And probably the biggest knock against neurology is that we do a very good job of understanding um, a problem. Uh, and, and we talk about that in terms of localizing a problem. So where in the nervous system is that a problem? But we don't do a very good job in terms of fixing that problem. So the surgical mentality, very different than the, the neurologic mentality. Um, but my feeling is that when, when people, patients are faced with those kinds of problems that we don't necessarily have answers to, um, it, it's very helpful to have, kind of at least understand those problems. 
Um, and in large part, it can sort of give you a clearer picture of, of, of how to deal with this. And so um, I've done sort of versions of this talk a couple times before for this meeting, um, but really the idea is to kind of focus on all the different ways in which uh, neuropathy can affect a person. And so uh, it's not just numb toes and, and burning feet, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. So the first thing to really understand is that nerves uh, are very much like telephone wires. And so nerves send signals the way that telephone wires send signals. Um, so if you can imagine, if I pick up the phone here and I call my house back in Phoenix and the connection is crackly, uh, then, then that's what you perceive when you perceive numbness, tingling, even weakness. Um, you perceive, you're perceiving that that connection is not very good. But you don't know when you're on that telephone whether the problem is here in LA, whether the problem is somewhere in Eastern California uh, or in Phoenix. And, and so the goal really is to kind of understand where that break in the connection is because there are very different diseases that affect the different parts of the nervous system. So the first and very important step we start with is trying to understand whether it belongs to one of two places. So there's a part of the nervous system that we call the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. And then there's what we call the peripheral nervous system, which are those telephone wires that leave the spinal cord and go out to the muscles and come back from the skin back to the spinal cord, sending the signals. But you can have identical symptoms. So a person can come in and they can say, my foot is numb, and that could be a brain problem, or it could be a spinal cord problem, or it could be a nerve problem. And obviously what causes a nerve problem is gonna be very different in most cases than what causes a brain problem. So we first have to start by trying to figure out where that is. And there are a number of different ways that we do that. So we do that by the physical exam. Uh, we do that by actually talking to the patient and trying to get a history and trying to say, what does it sound more like? Um, and then we very often will use a test that probably many of you had called EMG nerve conduction studies. And the EMG nerve conduction studies allows us to test the peripheral nervous system. We can't test the central nervous system with that test, but we can determine whether or not the peripheral nervous system is injured in, in some way or not. Once we know that the peripheral nervous system is the problem, we then break that into three groups. Uh, so there's the um, majority of patients with peripheral neuropathies have damage to what's called the sensory nerves. And the sensory nerves would allow you to feel. Um, so anything that causes damage to the sensory nerves is gonna damage your perception of sensation. So that could be numbness, which would be a loss of sensation, or it could be abnormal sensations. So burning, stabbing, stinging, pain. And that's really one of the most common symptoms from that. And a lot of patients will come in and they'll say, I don't really understand this, but my feet are numb and they hurt. And so it doesn't really seem like it makes a whole lot of sense because if they're numb, they're numb, and if they're, they hurt, they hurt. And so the way that I sort of explain that to people is if you've got a disease which is damaging those sensory nerves, you probably have two groups of nerves. Some of those nerves are dead. And dead nerves, like dead telephone wires, are going to send no signals. And if it sends no signals, your brain is going to perceive that, perceive that as a loss of sensation or numbness. But if you've got dead nerves, then you probably have nerves on the way to being dead, what I call sick nerves. And those sick nerves give off abnormal discharges. And those abnormal discharges then travel up to the brain, and your brain perceives them as whatever discharge that happened to be, so the burning, stinging, stabbing. So that's the majority of the problems that if you look at peripheral neuropathies, 90 plus percent of people, their main complaint relates to the sensory nerves. But you can also damage the motor nerves, and the motor nerves are what let us move. So if you damage the motor nerves, you can have weakness. And I, I tell people, sensory nerves are very, very complicated. They have lots of different types of information that they have to convey. Motor nerves are really stupid. Uh, it's just sort of yes or no. So if the motor nerve doesn't send a signal, you're weak. If the motor nerve does, you can move. It's pretty simple. And then there's a group of nerves that we call the autonomic nerves. And the autonomic nerves control all of our automatic behaviors. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this because there's a lot more attention being paid to these. So what do I mean when I say automatic behaviors? Well, your heart rate. Very hard to just sit here and say, I'm gonna make my heart rate be 150. You can't really do that. That's an automatic process. Um, your blood pressure. You can't raise your blood pressure by thinking about it. Um, your digestion, how the food moves through your stomach, your sweating. These are all functions of the autonomic nervous system. And these nerves can be damaged when you have a peripheral neuropathy as well. And for some groups of people, these are some of the most disabling symptoms because we have very, very poor treatments for those. 
So these are the symptoms of patients that have peripheral neuropathy. All of you know this. Um, so again, the loss of sensation, abnormal sensation weakness, so sensory nerves, motor nerves, and then balance difficulties really are a combination of the, those both. So we use the little muscles in our feet uh, to kind of grip the earth. So if you think you're sort of walking along and you kind of suddenly have to turn or you hit a crack in the curb, you very quickly need to grab hold of the earth to hold on to that. And so if those muscles are weak, your toe flexor muscles in particular, you can't really grab onto the earth and you're gonna topple over. Likewise, when we walk, we have to very quickly know where my foot is so I know where to put my next foot. And those sensations all travel through the sensory nerves. And so if those sensory nerves are damaged, you, can't, you don't do that as well. And so people start to have a lot of trouble with balance. And that becomes a major issue for peripheral neuropathy patients because we don't want people to fall. Uh, they break hips, they hit their heads, and, and bad things can happen. So what do we do about treating the neuropathic symptoms? I'll give you a little bit more sort of neurophysiology and then I'll probably stop for the most part. So I talked about the fact that nerves uh, send signals and nerves send signals electrically, right? So if I touch my foot and it travels up to my brain, that entire pathway is really an electrical pathway. And nerves generate electricity the same way that batteries generate electricity, right? So if you look at a battery, you've got a positive side to the battery and a negative side to the battery. And what that means is, is inside that battery, they put all the positive salts on one side and all the negative salts on the other. So positive salts are like sodium and potassium, and negative salts are like chloride. And when you separate the positive and the negative, you create current. And so every battery that we use, that's how that works. Um, your nerves do exactly the same thing. So to generate an electrical signal, and those of you that have peripheral neuropathy who've had this sensation, you're sitting in your chair at home and all of a sudden it feels like somebody put a pin through your big toe, okay? When that happens, that nerve or group of nerves generated an electrical signal for no good reason, okay? And so it does that by moving the positive salts and the negative salts. And so one of the most widely used types of medications to treat peripheral neuropathy symptoms are what we call the anti-convulsant drugs or anti-seizure medications. And for the most part, these medications all work by blocking those channels. So if there's less sodium or less chloride or less potassium moving through the channels, the nerves will generate fewer abnormal signals, and then hopefully there's fewer of those signals that travel up to the brain and cause the pain. So gabapentin Lyrica and 20 others. Uh, so a wide number of drugs that we use that basically all do the same thing. This is particularly important, and those of you that follow research, um, so for a long time, we've believed that the pain of peripheral neuropathy uh, has a lot to do with the movement of sodium. Um, and so we've tried to use sodium channel blocking drugs to prevent the movement of sodium. So how do we know that that works? Well, if I'm gonna do a biopsy on you, like a little skin biopsy or you know, the dermatologist is, they inject you with lidocaine, right? And in five seconds, you're numb. Well, how did lidocaine do that? Well, it blocked sodium channels. So we know that if you can block sodium channels, you can have no pain, right? The problem is those same sodium channels turn out to be in your heart, right? The heart works by electricity too. So if I gave you a lot, a lot of IV lidocaine, you probably wouldn't have pain, but you'd, your heart would probably stop. So it's not a very good trade-off. So in the last 10 years, people have discovered uh, specific drugs uh, and specific molecules that block only the sodium channels on the nerves that generate pain. And so there's a lot of hope about these drugs. They're not approved yet, but the idea being if we could just block the sodium channels that convey information about pain and leave the heart alone, we could have very effective drugs. The second category of drugs for neuropathic symptoms are the antidepressants, and not because people that have pain are depressed, but because we know that those antidepressants increase the level of two chemicals in the brain called serotonin and norepinephrine. And when you increase those two chemicals in the brain, our perception of pain is less. So it's not working down at the feet where the signals are being generated, but it's working up in the brain uh, to kind of stop our perception of pain. So Cymbalta uh, is an example of those, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, much older versions uh, of that as well. And then there's just pain medicines. And so there's obviously a lot of bad press uh, about narcotics, um, and there's a lot of reason not to use narcotics. On the other hand, narcotics actually are pretty darn effective. 
And the goal of all of these things is to try to improve your level of function. So I tell my patients, it's not that I don't care about your pain, but the pain's gonna vary from day to day. I can take away anybody's pain, right? So 500 milligrams of Demerol, you won't have any pain. Now, you'll be in a coma for 12 hours, but you won't have any pain. But I haven't improved your level of function, right? I want you to work and be able to do the things that you do normally. So with all of these medications, it's how do we balance uh, how much improvement there is in the pain versus uh, the side effects of the medications, because they all have the potential for side effects. Um, there's a lot of people that work on nutritional supplements, trying to give your body the building blocks they need to help regrow the nerves. I think there are people that are strong advocates of that, people that are less, I'm probably in the less uh, strong advocate of that. What I tell my patients is you want to be healthy, okay? So your body is trying to regrow these nerves. It's, it's really trying to do that. So you eat a good diet, you do some exercise, that's the right answer. And there are studies to show that both of those things do help. Is there one particular diet or one particular exercise that we know that works and the others don't? No. But being healthy is good, okay? Um, there's infrared light therapy, there's electrical stimulation, magnetic stimulation, all of which can be used, and there are some studies that show that those can be helpful as well. Um, as I said before, there are two groups of nerves, or two types of problems that people who lose sensation or have altered sensation can have. One is numbness and the other is pain. Although pain is very disabling, it turns out the bigger problem is really numbness because then you can't feel what's going on with your feet. And so this is an enormous problem for people with diabetic neuropathy, uh, other types of neuropathies as well. And it really, if you look at the patients that end up with amputations as a result of their peripheral neuropathy, it's almost always the patients that have anesthesia or loss of sensation, and not necessarily the patients that have lots of pain. Um, so it's very important to, to watch your feet. Um, I, I tell my patients with neuropathy once a year, see a podiatrist, get the nails clean, taken care of, calluses taken care of. Um, it, it is a very uh, important thing because this is an enormous number, tens of thousands of amputations as a result of neuropathy each year. The other thing I like to point out when we talk about this is, as I said, there are many things that can cause foot numbness or hand numbness or whatever. And so um, if we think about the nerves in the feet and we talk about peripheral neuropathy, that's something that's damaging the nerves in the feet. But a very common problem as people get older, uh, for me when I was 30, uh, is also to have pinched nerves in the back, okay? Um, and so um, there are many other things that can cause pain in the feet. So pinched nerves or spinal stenosis can do this. Uh, as people get older, uh, insufficient blood supply uh, in, in the legs, we call vascular claudication, can do this. Um, and to me, one of the most helpful questions here is, when are your symptoms worse? So I think there's, there's no 100% question ever in medicine, but this is one of the questions I think that gets very close to 100%. Peripheral neuropathy symptoms are almost always worse at rest and almost always worse at night. So when you're moving around and doing stuff and you have peripheral neuropathy, there's some kind of sensory distraction that takes your brain's focus away from it. The other types of problems that cause foot pain, so actually problems with the feet, problems with the nerves in the back, problems with the circulation, they generally get worse the longer you walk. Um, so if you have symptoms that you know, you're walking, 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 your legs hurting, you rest, then you can walk a little more, then your leg hurts again, that's usually not peripheral neuropathy. That's usually telling us there's something else going on. And then unfortunately, because the people that are affected with peripheral neuropathy, generally it's more common as people get older, well, as you get older, you're gonna have more vascular problems and more back problems, and so it's very common to have both. Uh, and then we have to try to figure out uh, which is which. Uh, other symptoms uh, can be uh, restless leg syndrome. Um, so it's very common to have an overlap of peripheral neuropathy with restless legs, um, and that can be treated separately. And then some people have uh, sleep disturbance, so we call periodic limb movements of sleep. So their legs are kind of jerking at night, keeps waking them up, and so you don't get restful sleep. Um, sexual symptoms are not talked about very much, um, but it's a, it's a big problem. Um, so again, if you lose sensation, uh, sexual function is gonna be diminished. Um, males usually experience that with erectile dysfunction. Uh, women can have difficulty uh, with uh, orgasms and vaginal dryness. Libido usually not affected um, by uh, peripheral neuropathy itself, except as it relates to the medications that we give people, which can all affect libido. <laughs> um, so some of these actually do have treatment, so Viagra and those type of medicines can be helpful, uh, and then the, the urologists have other more aggressive treatments as well. 
Um, the bladder is kind of part of the nerves and also part of that autonomic system. Um, so um, it, it's not a very common problem uh, in people with peripheral neuropathy. Um, but sometimes patients can have difficulty with sensation in the genital area, and so they just don't know that they need to go as well. Um, but again, it's important not just to blame every symptom that you have on the peripheral neuropathy. So if you're a 70-year-old male and you're going to the bathroom 20 times a day, it's probably your prostate, not your peripheral neuropathy, nine times out of 10. Again, we can, not me, but the urologist can fix that problem. Um, and, and same kinds of issues um, you know, with, with women as they get older are very common to have bladder dysfunction. So um, again, just have that evaluated sort of as you need to. The autonomic nerves do control the GI system. And so this is, this is a very big problem. It's not common, um, which is fortunate, um, but, but what the autonomic nervous system does is it allows the food, uh, tells the muscles in your gut to move the food through. And so if you eat and those muscles aren't working well, they're not getting the right signals from the nerves, then the food's not gonna move anywhere. So common symptoms are what we call early satiety. So you eat, you've got your whole plate there, and you eat like 10% of your meal and you feel full. You feel like you just had four visits to the buffet. Um, or in more severe cases, you eat and you throw up because the food's not leaving the stomach. Um, people can have severe weight loss, they can have constipation, diarrhea. Um, so all of these things need to be evaluated because again, what they lead to in large part is real nutritional problems, um, which again is gonna hurt the patient's ability to try to repair those nerves. Uh, cardiac symptoms, again, part of that autonomic system. This is probably more common than, than we sort of pay attention to. And again, it's complicated because as people get older, they're on medicines for heart rate and blood pressure, um, which can cause side effects like these. But, but basically, the, the common side effects here are really what we call, um, it's, it's lightheadedness, or the word is orthostasis, which means that when you stand up, uh, your body very quickly has to raise your blood pressure to get enough blood to your brain. So all of us have had that experience where you stand up and your head's kind of swimmy for two or three seconds. When that happens, it means that gravity all of a sudden is pulling all the blood out of your brain. Your brain's not getting enough blood and you feel kind of dizzy. So happening now and then, that's okay. People that have it happen very commonly, it's a problem. And for some people, it doesn't go away in two or three seconds. And for some people, it doesn't go away at all until they pass out. Um, and so pa actually passing out can be a very common uh, a symptom of having these types of autonomic problems as well. Um, so again, there are medications to help with all of that. It's important that that get evaluated, usually a combination of neurology and cardiology to make sure that the heart itself is okay and the problem isn't the heart. Once we know the problem isn't the heart, then we start to focus on uh, whether the problem could be the nerves to the heart uh, uh, causing that, those symptoms. So there's a test called autonomic testing, which can actually test uh, the way the heart rate and the blood pressure adjust. Um, I'm sure there's many labs here in LA. They're not in every city, you know, everywhere, um, but there's usually one kind of close enough to have it done. It's not a painful test at all. There's really, it's, you're pretty much just laying there for a couple of hours. Um, and then the treatment for this, number one, is to stop uh, the blood pressure medicines you're on, because if the problem is your blood pressure is too low and you keep falling down and passing out, we've got to get more blood into the brain. Uh, so we don't want you on uh, blood pressure medications. Um, and then we give lots of terrible advice to people, things you don't usually hear from your doctor, uh, like eat more salt uh, and eat more caffeine, uh, things that we know raise the blood pressure. Because again, what we want to do as neurologists is get more blood into the brain. Um, and, and so those things are helpful. Um, and then sometimes keeping the head of the bed elevated when you sleep. Because if you think about it, if your heart kind of rests all night, and then all of a sudden you're upright, it's a much bigger adjustment than if you're sleeping at about 45 degrees, 30 degrees, then when you get up, it's not as much of an adjustment. Um, swallowing problems are usually not that common in, in peripheral neuropathy. Uh, so, um, but, but it is a common problem, again, as people get older for lots of other reasons. Um, the symptoms of this are really kind of choking when you're eating or drinking. Um, very often, uh, it's worse with liquids. I know that's a little counterintuitive, but if you think about liquids, there's very little uh, sort of substance in your throat, and so it's harder to manipulate that around than a piece of solid food. Um, obviously, if there's weight loss, uh, we worry about that. And then that usually starts with either a speech therapy evaluation or a GI evaluation. If they don't find an answer, then it kind of comes back to neurology to say, could this be related to the neuropathy? And then again, some, sometimes it can. But these are the sort of, dysphagia is the word for uh, trouble with swallowing. 
Uh, these are the common causes for it. So usually surgeries that have disrupted the anatomy, stroke, much more common. Neuromuscular disease is only about 6% of the time. So uh, stomach issues more common than so the sort of upper GI issues uh, with peripheral neuropathy. Um, we probably do a terrible job uh, of dealing with this component of it. Uh, so for whatever reason, um, nerve pain is, is kind of different than other types of pain. So I'm, in my, the way I think about it, having done this now 25 years, is I think nerve pain is very unpredictable. Um, so you have a broken arm, it's going to hurt for a couple months, and then it's going to get better. We can kind of all cope with that. We sort of understand that. But nerve pain, you're fine for half the day, then you're miserable, or you're fine for a day, and then miserable for a week, or it gets hot outside and it's bad, or it gets cold outside and it's bad. I mean, there's just, there's just very, there's no way for us to really kind of predict that. And so I think that that leads not so much in, in what I think to depression as much as to anxiety, because you never know when the next flare up of the pain is going to be. Uh, and that's really, really terrible. Uh, that is, is legitimately terrible. So um, the data shows that about a third of patients with peripheral neuropathy suffer from either depression or anxiety. Um, so that's, that's important to at least be aware of that and to treat it. I'm a huge fan of that first thing there called cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, this is one of those things like if, if the government would say we all have to go to 10 sessions of CBT, like the world would be a better place. Like that's all it would take. Um, and so it's, it's really sort of a combination, uh, it's done by neuropsychologists, it's really kind of a combination of biofeedback, self-hypnotism, mindfulness, deep breathing, um, and the idea is at some point, uh, we as the doctor, you as the patient, have to accept the fact that we're not gonna fix you in 2018. And, and so now you have to live with the symptoms that you have, okay? And again, now the goal is how do we get you to function better? And, and in a large part, functioning better doesn't necessarily mean more medications, but, but functioning better may mean how do we learn to teach you to function better? And that's really the function of cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's actually really, really great. Uh, the problem is most insurance companies don't pay for it. Uh, if you look at uh, nice studies in peripheral neuropathy, about 10 sessions of CBT is enough to really teach you the, the tools that you need. Uh, the sessions are probably somewhere around 150 to $200, so it's not cheap. Uh, it's you know a couple thousand dollars, but those are tools you then use for the rest of your life. Um, and so you know a lot of the very good pain clinics around uh, will have neuropsychologists that do cognitive behavioral therapy. Again, exercise is really important. Exercise alone helps depression. Uh, my youngest daughter is actually doing a research project at uh, Harvard right now, studying that exact question. Um, and then we use the medications as well. So it does turn out that those medications like Cymbalta that, that help with nerve pain in people who don't have depression and anxiety also help with people with depression and anxiety who don't have nerve pain. So it's always nice as a doctor if you're gonna prescribe a drug kind of to kill two birds with one stone. Um, so we do use these drugs if we start to get, if you tell, tell us that there's some depression and anxiety, we get a sense there's some depression and anxiety, but they also work, uh, as I said, just for pain even without depression and anxiety. And then a lot of that leads um, to sleep dysfunction. Um, so this is, a, again, a very common problem. As I said before, peripheral neuropathy pain is worse at night. So you're laying in bed, you're trying to go to bed, your feet are stabbing, burning, there's no possible way you can go to bed, you're not gonna sleep. Uh, if you don't sleep, you're gonna be more miserable and you're gonna have more pain. Um, so trying to regulate sleep, uh, what we call sleep hygiene, uh, is a very important part of trying to manage the sort of holistic uh, effects of peripheral neuropathy. Um, that might mean treating restless leg syndrome, it might mean treating the pain at night, um, and there might be other sleep problems. Um, so sometimes it's sleep apnea or other sleep disorders that are causing the sleep to be disrupted. Um, but again, there's very good data to show if you can improve a person's sleep, uh, you actually reduce their pain. Um, so it's a very important thing to really pay attention to. And this is really kind of the, the, the mess that we're all in, which is, again, everything I told you from a medication standpoint that I would love to give you, uh, they all cause side effects. <laughs> Um, so what I usually tell people is, you don't want to take any of these, and it's really pretty much kind of like pin the tail on the donkey, and I'm the one with the blindfold. Um, so I don't know what your neurochemicals are doing, what your sodium channels are doing. Um, I know what drugs work for a population of people, because I've read the studies, and I know if 500 people take this versus this, they do better. But in an individual, I'm absolutely an idiot, okay? And, and so what you have to do is say, okay, I, the pain is bad enough, I want to try one of these medicines. 
Um, when you try it and it doesn't help the pain, you call the doctor back and you tell us we're stupid, and then we try the next one. Uh, when you try the medicine and uh, the medicine causes side effects, same thing, we're stupid, we try another one. Um, but it really is very much trial and error. And at some point, unfortunately, for a lot of people, after number six, number eight, that we all just kind of get frustrated and go, all right, maybe medication isn't the answer here. And then we think about those non-medical treatments. So the antidepressants that are supposed to help with depression and anxiety could all make, all make depression and anxiety worse. <laughs> uh, they can affect your thinking. They can cause nausea. Uh, the anticonvulsants, um, again, they're seizure medications uh, that are blocking those channels to improve pain, but it also means they're working on the channels in your brain. So dizzy, dopey, stupid. Uh, are really kind of the main side effects that come from those as a group because if we're slowing the nerves in your feet down, we might be slowing the nerves in your brain down. And then again, the opiates. So a lot of bad publicity about the opiates. Um, I, I am a believer that there's a absolute place for them. I have a lot, a lot of patients on opiates. But again, the question has to be not did your pain go from an eight out of a 10 to a six out of a 10? Because once you accept the fact that we're not really gonna be able to fix this type of nerve pain, that doesn't, really, that doesn't really matter terribly much. What you wanna say is, could you do nine holes of golf that you couldn't do before? Or could you sit at a movie uh, for two hours without having to get up and walk around that you couldn't do before? Can you think as well as you used to do before? And so if we can get your level of function better without causing bad side effects of the opiates, that's really a great place uh, for us to use those. If we use opiates, most of us prefer the kind of longer acting medications. Um, so almost all of them have some extended release form. And the idea in the chronic pain world is that you don't want these up and down cycles where you take a Percocet, you're better for three hours, the pain comes back, you take another Percocet, and you kind of do that throughout the day. There's sort of a theory that that kind of entrains the brain to keep the pain going, as opposed to a constant level of pain medicine where we just bring it down and there's fewer side effects that way. Uh, with the opiates, again, sedation, that's, you know, they're sedating, obviously, and then um, constipation is a big side effect there, um, so we have to pay attention to that. All right, so um, that's sort of how neuropathy affects us. Uh, again, I, the, the first point is a really important one. So I see a lot of people, I mean, I, I get another example, a person who's had neuropathy in their feet for 10 years, they come in and they say, you know, my right hand is numb for the last three months, and it wakes me up at night. Uh, and it's my peripheral neuropathy. Well, nine times out of 10, it's their carpal tunnel syndrome, and it's something else, or it's a pinched nerve in their neck. And those are things that we can actually fix. So when you have new symptoms, when things change, um, it's important not just to blame it on the neuropathy. Get back to your doc, uh, tell them about it, and see if anything else uh, needs to be done. There's a lot of different treatments for the symptoms, um, not as many treatments for the underlying disease as we'd like yet. Um, but again, it all starts with really understanding where the problem is coming from. Uh, if you've got a little disc in your back and you've got neuropathy, um, we've got to figure out which we think is the biggest problem because treating the back obviously is not going to be helpful if the problem is with uh, the neuropathy. And then really, uh, again, I'm a, you, having, I think what happens is you come out of med school and you're like, oh, I can treat everybody with drugs. And then after 20 years, you're like, all right, I don't think I can really do that. Um, so I'm a big believer in trying to um, even take people off of medicines and just say, are you worse off of this? Um, because I will tell you, probably a large, if not the majority of the time, they're really not worse off of it. And so then I'd rather not have them on medications. And then look at these alternative therapies, so diet, aqua therapy, uh, exercise, uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy, um, sometimes just having somebody, even if it's a, you know, a, a religious person in your life that you can talk to um, and get to the point that you can kind of accept that this is where I am, um, and now let me work on functioning better. Um, so that's good. I'm, I'll stop there, and I can, if there's any questions. Yeah, so the question was about the other, uh, how do we treat the other symptoms of autonomic neuropathy? So most of the medications that we have that are good, I would say, uh, are focused on the heart symptoms. So they raise blood pressure. Oh, yeah. uh, they, they raise blood pressure. Um, they put more volume in your blood vessels. Um, and they are, they, those can be really helpful. 
We don't have great medicines to improve the movement of the food through the stomach. There are a couple. Um, so there's a medication called uh, metoclopramide, um, which some people use. The downside to that one is it, it can have a lot of neurologic side effects, and particularly if you're on it for a long period of time. So most neurologists and most GI doctors try to avoid that for, for long periods of time. Uh, there's a medication called erythromycin, which is an antibiotic. Uh, that actually, uh, the reason people get nauseous who take it is because it increases the movement of the food through the stomach. Um, and so we use that sometimes. Um, sometimes it's a matter of just um, kind of teaching people to eat differently. So again, if you're not moving food through your stomach well, uh, a 12-ounce steak is probably not the right way to go, but you could have four three-ounce meals of steak. <laughs> so you eat smaller, more frequent meals. And then, I mean, I've got many patients that the, the symptoms are so severe, it, it can eventually lead to needing a feeding tube. Um, so they just can't eat. So the GI symptoms are tough because we just don't have a, a ton to do uh, with that right now. Um, bladder symptoms, we have some, I mean, the bladder is, uh, I, I described the bladder, it's, it's just a, it's like a balloon. Um, so it only, only does two things. It fills up, but it empties. Um, so we have medications uh, to help if the bladder is contracting too often um, that are pretty effective. Um, they're used widely, widely for people without autonomic neuropathy. If the bladder doesn't contract, uh, the only treatment for that is to do a catheter um, because we don't have any medicines to make the bladder contract. And then the other one that actually is a big problem that we have nothing for, almost nothing for, which is really frustrating, is that autonomic nervous system controls our sweating. Um, and you can have people that have, ter and your temperature regulation. And so uh, people can have a terrible time with either sweating too much, or I have one patient that overheats, and I live in Phoenix anyway, but because uh, she, can't, she can't sweat. Um, and, and so we, we don't really have any medicines for those except just trying to, you know, cooling vests and trying to control the environment. I just want more back there. So the, the question was about the variability. I don't know why I'm doing that now. The variability in the, the neuropathy symptoms. I, yes, I, I think that's the norm. Uh, I, I mean, there are some people that say my pain's always a seven, you know, every day, 24 hours a day. Uh, that's, that's the rarity. Um, and then patients, understandably, then try to like tie it into, well, what could it be? And, and the problem is I, I hear every answer. So I hear, Again, when it's hot, it's worse. When it's cold, it's worse. When I eat gluten, it's worse. When I don't eat gluten, it's worse. When I eat sugar, it's worse. When I, so I believe them all. I mean, it's not that I don't believe them. I just think everybody's anatomy is different. And so I can't say, so it's very reasonable to, you know, uh, we used to, um, I guess people still do, uh, headache experts um, will tell their difficult patients with headaches to keep a headache diary. And part of that headache diary is like, how did you sleep? What did you eat? Uh, you know, stress, and then you can look back and you can go, oh, you know, uh, every time I ate or had red wine, I got a headache the next day. And so then the choice is you can either have the red wine or have the headache. So um, I think you could do that probably and start to learn a little bit and say, are there certain things? Um, again, I think sleep, lack of sleep is probably pretty consistent. You, you get stressed, you know, my son's wedding, you're awake for a week, and uh, uh, you're not sleeping as much, the neuropathy pain is going to be worse. Um, but from a dietary exercise standpoint, it's just really variable among people. It's a good question. So uh, the question was about spinal cord stimulators. So the idea here is, so think about the telephone and wire analogy, right? So you've got wires in your feet that are going up to your brain. Uh, they're sending wrong signals. Uh, and so the theory goes, if you could put a little electrical impulse uh, in the middle of that pathway, so somewhere in your spinal cord, uh, you can distract those bad signals from traveling up to the brain. Um, people use them a lot, and I've definitely had some patients that tell me that they're helpful. The one thing that I like about them is that I think all pain doctors will do a trial. So before they implant this permanent device in you, uh, they put the device in you, and you wear it for about a week. And the question is, did it really, really help enough to have a permanent device implanted in you? 
So that trial, there's very little risk to. And if it's a home run, that's great. I mean, again, it has really essentially no side effects other than the, the procedure of putting it in. Um, I, again, I think it's hit or miss. I, I, I usually don't recommend it for the vast, vast majority of people. But if patients have tried a bunch of medications and they research it and they come in and they say, should I try it? I go, yeah, you can try it. <laughs> Last one? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so the question was about the caffeine. The caffeine is one of the things we'll use for patients that have that autonomic neuropathy. So again, for those people, their blood pressure is not high enough. So as, as neurologists, we want a lot of blood in the brain. Um, and so if people are, are fatigued, not thinking well, passing out, lightheaded, um, then we've gotta get more blood to the brain. Um, and so we're trying to raise the blood pressure uh, as a way of getting more blood into the brain. So caffeine for general purposes, and I probably drink too much, uh, not that healthy um, because it does raise your blood pressure and, and we don't want to do that for the general population. If you have a problem where your blood pressure is too low, again, we tell people to eat a lot of salt. In fact, we prescribe salt tablets. Um, uh, people just eat salt uh, as a way of getting their blood pressure up. Because if you're trying to lower your blood pressure, we tell you don't eat salt. So we want to raise the blood pressure, we say eat salt, pretzels, whatever. Um, and then the same with caffeine. Is it kind of another simple way of raising the blood pressure without having to go to the medications? Because we do have some very effective medications to raise the blood pressure, but they're a little more complicated and much more expensive than a coffee. <laughs> Should I stop or? Okay, one more, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so there's not really an average for that one. It's a good question. So one of the ways to think about that is, oh, sorry, the question was how long does it take to be diagnosed with neuropathy? So um, people, I'm going to answer that in a roundabout way. So people will come in and, and I tell them I have neuropathy. Understandably, one of the first questions they have is, do I have to be worried I'm going to be in a wheelchair, be disabled, die uh, as a result of the neuropathy? Um, and, and, and I always tell them, the best predictor of your future is your past. So if they come to see me and they've had the neuropathy for 20 years and they're walking around, they're fine, okay? <laughs> neuropathy doesn't like, go really, really slow, then do this, okay? Um, so it's kind of the same, that's the, the, the point about your question, which is the patients that have really bad neuropathies that end up in the hospital paralyzed, we diagnose very quickly because they've done Okay, and somebody's got to figure out now why they're in the hospital paralyzed. So Guillain-Barre, for example, CIDP are diseases that don't take years and years to diagnose because the patient would either be dead or something else would have happened. So, um, but for the kind of regular neuropathy, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the burning feet, pain, um, it, it could take years uh, in many cases. And again, and one of the problems is also the question of misdiagnosis. So you go in with painful feet, and one of the causes of that is a problem with your back. And most people over 50 have got a lot of arthritis in their back. So then they get an MRI scan of their back, and the next thing you know, you end up with surgery on your back. And then six months later, your feet are worse. And in some bad cases, you have a second surgery on your back. Um, and so that point I made early on was that you have to start with the localization. So finding a doctor that, is really, that you have confidence in and, and that they can tell you where the problem is. Um, so all those make it kind of difficult. But so it, it's just, it's, it's really kind of all over the board. And some people are, have inherited neuropathies that they're born with and don't really present with symptoms until they're 50 or 60 years old. So it can take decades in some cases. So. All right, thanks.